Hey everyone, here's Dave talking about <laughs> glass. There, I introduced you. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> the show, All right. Hello, my talented friends. <laughs> okay, I'm talking about structural glass today. Um, uh, we've talked in structures one and structures two a lot about stress strain curves, and so I thought I'd share with you the stress strain curve for glass just to put it in context. We have a perception, similar to, I know Shannon's talked about this, how you have a perception of concrete as, as an absolutely rigid material. And your perception of concrete as a rigid material comes from the fact that this concrete is weak, therefore it is made robust, and when it's robust, it's very stiff. Glass is sort of similar. We, we think of glass as a fragile material, or, or as a weak material, because it's fragile. Um, so let me explain what that means. Um, this is the stress strain curve for glass. Tensile strength of glass, 3,500 newtons per millimeter squared. 3,500 MPa, 10 times as strong as conventional structural steel. Um, utterly counterintuitive. Part of the reason why it's counterintuitive is that elongation at break is 4.5%. Compare that to steel, it's 30%. Um, what this means is that glass is not a tough material. It's extremely strong, but as soon as it, as soon as it, it uh, has too much strain and a little bit too much movement, it will break. Um, that also means that a very small flaw can propagate a crack. Um, I feel like I should introduce a fracture mechanics slide here, but um, if you take a, a solid piece of material and you put a little notch in it um, and you put some tension on it, at the tip of our little notch you get a stress concentration. And the, the sharper the notch is, the higher the stress concentration. So with an average stress of 100 MPa, you might have 1000 MPa or 5000 MPa locally right at the tip of the, uh, um, of the notch. Um, and so that's what happens with glass. You, you damage it, it forms a very, very sharp notch, uh, which means you get a very high stress concentration there, um, which means that you fail the glass in tension locally, just over a very small depth. But what that does, it increases the depth of the notch. When you increase the depth of the notch, you increase the stress concentration around the notch, and now your problem is worse than it was a minute ago. Um, and the crack will propagate all the way through the glass, even under fairly low stress. So, um, extremely strong material, um, but its useful strength is not all that much. Um, fiberglass solves that problem by giving you glass in tiny little fibers. And, and the reason why that's effective is that you don't get uh, crack propagation from one fiber, fiber to the next. So with, with, um, with uh, fiberglass, the useful strength is actually much higher than solid glass. So here are some properties. Uh, the density, 2793 kilograms per meter cube, makes it just about equal to concrete. A little bit heavier than concrete, but very similar. Young's modulus, um, it's about a third of steel. That's the stiffness. Um, a third of steel, about three times what, what concrete would be. Um, what's the other one we, worth, worth looking at here? Approximate tensile strength, 170 MPa. This would be the kind of the useful tensile strength before application of safety factors. 175, 170 MPa, you can see that that's 5% of the 3500 MPa that I just showed you. So that's the impact of it being brittle. But 170 MPa is still a very, very big number. It's very strong material. Um, composition of glass. Silica dioxide is the primary uh, ingredient in glass. Um, and in fact, you can make glass with nothing else. Silicon, you, you melt, up, melt silicon dioxide and, uh, and cool it at, uh, at an appropriate rate that prevents the formation of crystals, and you wind up with silicon dioxide, uh, or with, with glass. Um, uh, essentially beach sand. You melt, melt beach sand, cool it, and you get glass. 
Um, other ingredients, soda and lime, will reduce the melting point. Um, and since we have to melt glass, if we can reduce the melting point of glass, that makes the, the production easier and more economical. So often we'll, we'll, we'll put uh, silica or lime in glass. Um, other ingredients that can be added can, do, can change the properties, like uh, changing the coefficient of expansion of glass. Now it sounds like, what's the big deal? What if, um, you know, it doesn't move very much anyway. It's not like window glass moves a lot. It makes a gigantic difference if you have big thermal stresses. So the big advancement of Corningware, cookware, is that they developed a glass formulation that had a very low coefficient of expansion. Um, if you have a low coefficient of expansion, um, when you pour boiling water into it, it doesn't break. Uh, because it doesn't expand and you don't get differential stress across the thickness. Um, and then the, the ingredients also change the color. So iron oxide, for example, will make glass uh, give it a slightly uh, green tint, which is standard. Um, um, so the crystal structure of, of glass, um, there isn't one. Um, there is no crystal structure in glass. It's it's a uh, it's cooled at a rate that prevents the formation of a crystal structure. That's the reason why glass is brittle, and it's also the reason why it's clear. Um, if there is a crystal structure, it becomes opaque. There are natural forms of, of glass. A fulgurate on the left forms when lightning hits a, a, a bed of sand, hits the beach, hits the desert, um, and it will, will instantaneously um, vaporize and, and melt um, the sand uh, and then it cools into a fulgurite, natural glass. Obsidian is volcanic glass and obsidian and you can see actually if you look you can see the, the kind of these curved surfaces um, it's the lack of crystal structure that makes the the obsidian um, break in compound curve forms um, uh, and also allows it to break extremely sharp. So uh, obsidian is used to make knives and arrowheads and things um, historically. Um, obsidian is not clear because of the presence of um, iron oxide. Phase change of glass. This is actually not as interesting a slide. It phase changes phase. You get it hot enough, it'll melt. You get it hotter again, it turns to, to, to gas like, like uh, most solids. Um, Manufacturing process, there's a number of ways the glass is manufactured. The Pilkington process for making um, plate glass involves heating the glass to molten at around 1600 degrees. Um, at around 1100 degrees, the molten glass is poured onto a bed of molten tin. Um, and the, it's poured onto molten tin because molten tin is super, super flat. and uh, so when the glass, but it's heavier than glass. Um, so the glass will float on the surface and it'll take the profile of the molten tin, which is super, super flat. Um, it's cooled to around 600 degrees in the float bath and then rolled out into an annealing layer. Um, a layer is just another word for oven as near as I can tell. Um, so it's an oven that takes it from 600 degrees down to about 200 degrees at a, at a very precise rate. Um, that, that prevents the formation of, uh, of crystal structure within the glass. Um, once it comes out of the annealing layer, it can be cut. It's essentially one continuous process. So a continuous um, sheet of glass coming out of the, uh, the process and then it's cut as it goes. Um, before Pilkington came up with float glass, um, glass was often made by uh, the, a drawing process. So it was cooled to the point where it was, it was sort of um, solid but, um, but workable and then lifted out of a bath and, and uh, flattened through rollers. Um, it's a uh, drawing gra glass is still made today. Because glass is like a, a super cooled fluid, um, so it's not, without crystal structure, it's not really a solid in some ways, it will flow. Um, drawing glass is imperfect, it's not as flat as float glass, um, 
and, uh, and it doesn't have the same optical quality as float glass. Um, but there is still a place for artisanal glasses in, in, the, uh, in the world. Um, float glass is a gigantic process, so you can't really change the formula for float glass. You can't make colored float glass, for example. But drawn glass is a batch production um, methodology. And, um, and anything that you do in, in a batch production as opposed to continuous production, you can change the formula. So we can make uh, colored glass, as you can see in this slide. Um, before drawn glass, there was cylinder glass. Um, so the, the glass is, you start with a lump of glass, you blow it to make it hollow, you continuously blow it, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It gets rolled um, to make it into a cylinder. Instead, of you blow something, it's always going to be a sphere. Um, you roll it into a cylinder, and you can see the cylinders on the top right. Um, and then the ends are cut off with a, with a red-hot knife. The ends of the cylinders are cut off, and it's sliced down one side. Um, it can then be put in an annealing oven and rolled flat. Um, and that's how we create flat, uh, flat sheets from cylinder glass. Obviously, you can make bottles and things as well. You don't have to cut it open, but, but um, uh, cylinder glass is, a, is an artisanal process for making flat glass. Cast glass is exactly what you would expect. You heat it up to uh, um, liquid, pour it in a mold. Um, uh, the, you can uh, have, you have a bottom mold, and so, so, which is a negative. Um, and then you can have a top mold as well. And before the glass completely cools, you push down the top mold and you can put a, um, uh, a pattern or a, uh, an impression in the far side as well. So we are most interested in window glass uh, as architects and engineers. Um, there are a number of types of, of window glass. Um, they are all chemically identical. Um, so in a way, there's not different types, but, but um, uh, regular glass is called annealed glass. Annealing is the process of cooling at a specific rate that prevents um, undesirable locked-in stresses and, and makes it relatively strong. So regular old window glass is annealed glass. Tempered glass is made by heating annealed glass up to, to something short of um, um, something short of uh, <clears throat> um, molten, and then rapidly cooling it. So, what happens then um, is we we heat it up, we rapidly cool it. It gets smaller, but it's colder on the surfaces than it is in the middle. But it's a uniform dimension. Hot in the middle, cold on, on the surfaces, and of un, uniform dimension. Then we get the middle, the whole thing then gradually uh, cools. The middle part, which was hotter, shrinks um, more rapidly than the, or shrinks more than the outer parts because they're pre cooled. Um, as it shrinks, it is prevented from shrinking by the outer parts, which are trying not to shrink because they were already cool. Um, so they're trying not to shrink, the middle's trying to shrink. The impact, impact of that is the middle, which is being prevented from shrinking, goes into tension. The outer edges, which are trying to shrink, then go into compression. So what we wind up with, with tempered glass, is, uh, is a stress gradient through the glass, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about that in a second. Heat strengthened glass is somewhere in between tempered and annealed glass. Um, tempered glass poses problems and very difficult to work with uh, for reasons that I'll talk about in a minute. So, um, so heat strengthened glass gives you, gives you uh, better strength characteristics than annealed glass, but it doesn't have the, the uh, vulnerabilities of tempered glass. Um, and then we, we can have uh, laminated glass. Um, laminated glass is two or more layers of glass stacked together 
with an interlayer uh, in between and compressed in, into each other. The interlayer is clear, um, so you experience laminated glass every time you get in your car. Your front windshield is laminated glass. Um, it's the reason why when your front windshield, when you get a stone break or something, it doesn't void the opening. The interlayer um, keeps the uh, windshield uh, in place. So I talked about how with tempered glass, we rapidly cool it so that it's cold on the outside and warm in the middle, um, but of a uniform size. Um, then as it cools to a constant temperature through the thickness, the middle wants to stay long but is prevented uh, from, uh, but is forced to shrink. So I'm saying this backwards, regardless, the, um, what we wind up with is the, um, uh, the outer edges are in compression and the inner edges are in tension, uh, or in the, and then the core is in tension. Um, remember what I said that, that um, if we get a flaw in the surface, we wind up with a very sharp point, or a sharp notch with a stress concentration which causes a crack to propagate. The crack will only propagate in tension, it doesn't propagate when there's compression. And so tempered glass gives us this region of, of toughness that, that we can have surface flaws in, um, uh, in tempered glass that, that will, not propagate a um, will not propagate a crack. And, uh, and therefore the usable strength of tempered glass is much higher. So to put it in context, regular annealed glass, the, the kind of allowable stress on annealed glass is something like 20 MPa. The allowable stress on heat strengthened glass is something like 40 MPa. And on tempered glass, it's 100 MPa. So it's effectively five times stronger than um, regular annealed glass. Let me come back and just elaborate um, laminated glass for a minute. So, um, so laminated glass, um, we have a clear interlayer between the two layers that prevents the um, um, prevents the glass from you know you can have a breakage of one light and, and it maintains its integrity very helpful if you're driving your car and you get a stone chip that the the windshield doesn't doesn't shatter and blow shards into your face and, um, uh, the interlayer is perfectly clear so you can't see that it's there it has the ability to transfer shear in the short term we know that when if you can transfer shear it's composite two layers um, when shear transfer is eight times as stiff, four times as strong as a single layer. Um, but the standard PVB polyvinyl butyl laminate interlayer creeps. Um, so we consider laminated glass to be composite for short duration loads, so wind gusts, for example, but non composite for anything of any sort of longer duration. Uh, such as self-weight or snow or something like that. Um, so, designing glass. Um, you know, we tend to think of structural designers that, that um, it, had, it can't break. Okay, well, it's, well, it's our strength, stiffness, stability continuum. Can't break, fine, you're not done yet. It can't deflect excessively. That's our stiffness part of our continuum. Fine, you, you make it stiff enough. Um, and uh, but you're not done yet. The hazard in the event of breakage has to be controlled um, with glass. With with steel, it's tough, which means that it'll deform, it find new load paths, and and uh, it's very difficult to get steel to collapse. Whereas glass, <clears throat> a small flaw will cause um, cause failure, and in fact. 
um, you probably remember the, the glass balconies spontaneously breaking in the city of Toronto a few years ago that, that led to the development of the new A500 CSA standard on, on guards. Um, there wasn't anything wrong with the glass. The glass is fine. Just the natural rate of background breakage is something like one piece in a thousand. But when you're building 10,000 units a year of condos and they all have glass guards, then, um, uh, then it's an epidemic of failing guards uh, just with the normal statistical background breakage rate. The failure is not due to any actual damage. The failure is was um, uh, little, little bits of um, iron oxide and, and, and chemical imperfections within the glass. So very little tiny things, but they would start to propagate and crack. Um, they were typically tempered glass, because tempered glass is stronger. It can, sounds like a good thing. You make it out of strong glass. Um, but, but the problem is that when you've got the compression and the tension in the middle, you wind up with a lot of locked-in stresses. Locked-in stress is potential energy. Locked-in stress is like, like holding your glass up in the air. Potential energy, you let it go, it falls. Um, or pulling this string on a bow, you've got potential energy. You let it go, it snaps. The locked-in stress in the glass is potential energy. As soon as you release it, um, it, um, uh, it shatters and, and in, in an explosive type failure um, and completely voids the opening. Um, so we have to manage the hazard in the event of uh, breakage. Um, so what are the things we do? Well, with a guard, um, the code requires us to put a continuous rail on the top. So what that means is that if a glass light breaks, we have an element that's spans to the adjacent glass lights and that's how we manage our hazard. Um, the A new A500 standard and what's currently coming into, into um, uh, common use is there's now a rigid interlayer that you can have. So the traditional PVB interlayer is soft, you break the glass in a guard and it would just slump over. Um, the, the new interlayer, the new rigid interlayer that can be applied will maintain the glass in a, in a, uh, in a fairly rigid, fairly strong uh, vertical orientation. So that's another way to manage the hazard. If you have a glass floor, a glass stair, the um, either light, so it has to be composite, and either light has to be able to carry the weight of a person um, in the event of breakage. Um, so so when, you know, for full design live load, for example, you can rely on load sharing between the two glass lights. But there is always the possibility that somebody's going to drop something hard on the glass and it's going to break the top light, for example. You need to make sure that the bottom glass light has the capacity to carry it. Um, similarly, someone could be walking up the stairs carrying a mop or something and, and hit, a, hit a stair from below. Um, uh, so that's another way of managing hazard. Um, in a canopy, we, we can't have glass falling on the ground in the event of an overload. Um, so, so either we need to provide a net below the canopy, or we use laminated glass with an interlayer. And if we use laminated glass with an interlayer, then we have to make sure that the interlayer will span as a catenary um, to the points of support, um, so that the so that the interlayer will will prevent get glass from falling on the uh, on the sidewalk below. So fire weight fire rated glazing. Uh, what do we do when we want to use glass in a rated assembly? Well, we can we can use Georgian wired glass. This is Probably in the you know the primary school when you went to school as a kid, you found that that certain interior doors would have tall narrow windows with Georgian wired glass, um, and uh, that wasn't a design idea. That was they were wired glass because that was a fire rated door, and you could count on the glass standing up and and not voiding the opening. So it prevented uh, passage of gas and smoke through the opening 
even if the glass cracked because of uh, uh, thermal cracking. Uh, borosilicate glass, so that's the Corningware. So this is low, low coefficient of um, thermal expansion. And what that does is when you have differential stress, I'm going to talk about this afterwards, differential stress is, is a common cause of breakage. If you have a low coefficient of thermal expansion, you don't get expansion contraction, you don't get differential stresses. Um, you can have intermassive laminate glass. Um, so that interlayer can intermass, like intermassive paint, which means that it swells up, foams up, and becomes an insulator. Um, in fire separations, you can use this intermassive into laminate, laminate glass. Um, you can use an intermassive cavity gel in, uh, in a double glazed unit. Or what is most commonly done is the glass is sprinkled. So if you have a constant deluge of water, even with, with fire on one side, the glass won't heat, heat up enough to fail. And you can have a fire rated glazed partition. Glass can be curved. Slump forming it involves uh, heating up glass and, form, and allowing it to, to, um, uh, to slump into a curved shape. Press forming is the same, it's just you're impatient, so you push down from the top, it's not just its own self weight. Um, and then roller hearth forming. Both slope forming and press forming, we can get compound curvature, like the windshield of your car. Uh, roller hearth forming is for your big curved glass windows at uh, one blur. Um, you know, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a larger scale process, um, only uh, single curvature on roller hearth forming. Um, edge treatments, lots of edge treatments are, are possible. Glass can be ground and polished. The exception to this is um, uh, tempered glass. As soon as you start polishing tempered glass, you're going you're gonna to penetrate through that compression zone and you're going to pre precipitate a failure. So if you need edge treatment on uh, tempered glass, you need to do it before it gets tempered. Connections to glass. Um, we can bolt glass. Um, so the image on the left is just a standard bolted connection. Um, the, uh, the bolt bears on the, on the edge of the glass hole. Um, it's fine for, for low strength connections. So the, the glass hole is not perfect. The bolt is slightly smaller than the glass hole. If you take a, a, a small pin in a big hole, you know, you know that if everything is rigid, you are bearing on an infinitesimal point. Um, the bearing is not spread over the surface of the, uh, of the bowl. You're bearing on a point. Um, now, if you remember discussion about Poisson's ratio, if you compress something this way, it expands this way. If you compress it this way, it expands this way. When you bear your bolt against the glass, you may be compressing it this way, but there is simultaneously, there is tension in the other direction, um, necessarily. And uh, um, so bolted connections, rigid body against uh, glass, not ideal. Um, we can use a patch plate. A patch plate is essentially grabbing the glass like this. You clamp it with a bolt and you put a soft gasket between the pat patch plate and the glass and you have a gap around the bolt and then you can, you can carry the glass that way. Um, countersunk bolts. Countersunk bolts are effective, slightly more effective in fact than normal bolts because you, you have um, a, a greater bearing surface. Um, and also, if they're machined well, you're, you do have full contact in a countersunk bolt where you have point contact with a regular bolt. Um, stud assemblies. So in this stud assembly, that is carrying the vertical weight over a large surface. Uh, it's still, in a way, a point support, but, but it's, it's much closer to being a full bearing surface. These elements here are just there to retain the, the uh, plate that has the stud. Um, then the Pilkington planer system. Um, this involves, the Pilkington planer system can include um, uh, essentially like a ball bearing. It's an articulated joint which just ensures there's no prying in the connection, that the, that the load has to be dead concentric within the joint.
some guidelines for cutting cutting holes. You got to stay a certain distance away from from the edge um, as a function of thickness. So four times the thickness uh, would be the minimum spacing or minimum distance from a corner. About one and a half times thickness is the minimum distance um, from an edge. Um, I'm going to just let you guys have a look at these on your own because there's uh, well because I've got to join a conference call in a few minutes, but but there was also something that I wanted to, to really get to. Um, yeah, so this is this is an introduction to this notion. Um, glass in the plane is extremely rigid um, in its plane, much more rigid than whatever it is you're going to carry it with. So. If we take a big pane of glass and we put four supports on, or put three supports underneath that, two supports are going to carry all the load and the third one won't do anything. And we don't know which one is going to carry all the load because it's a function of the rigidity and, and the exact dimensions of our three supports. Um, glass is so rigid that the load will always go to the supports in a statically determinate way and it doesn't matter how many supports you have only the ones that are, are the minimal number of supports necessary are going to carry the load. Which sounds convenient, except that that means that um, you had better have enough capacity in those connections. So when we have glass in a frame, the frame at the bottom is not carrying the weight of the glass, so the frame all the way across the bottom. The glass is being carried by two little rubber blocks in the two bottom corners. Um, because that's the statically determinate load path. And the glass is far more rigid than the frame at the bottom. So if it tried to, to, to load the frame, the frame would just sag anyway. Um, so the reason I bring that up is that all these fancy connections are about ensuring a statically determinate load path. If you have a piece of glass like this and you want to restrain all degrees of freedom, you pick up one corner, restrain it horizontally and vertically. Right? Maybe this is easier for you to see. One corner, restrain horizontally and vertically. This corner over here, oops, restrain vertically only. You release it horizontally. You've already taken care of the horizontal component up there. The top connections don't carry any vertical load at all. You've already taken care of the vertical down here. The top connection carries only one horizontal load and that's it to prevent, to prevent overturning or not even a horizontal load um, you know the, the top connections probably only restrain it in and out of the page um, um, other thing to bear in mind so glass is always going to be more rigid than your building um, which means that if you have a frame connected to your building and you've got some racking in the building, the frame is going to do this. The glass is not. The glass doesn't move at all. The frame does. Um, and your glass slips in your frame like this. So the frame is moving back and forth with the building. The glass is staying perfectly rigid. Um, because of that, we have to limit the, the drift on a building to 1 in 500, 0.2% is the normal rule. Where that comes from is that, is that if it's more than 0.2%, your glass is going to slide right out of your frame and you're going to break all your seals. Um, um, so, so these are some cable, some cable truss details. I don't think we need to elaborate those. This image, I think, is really nice because it shows you exactly where all the forces are being um, being picked up in a way that is exactly statically determined and predicted and every other possible load path is released. Um, this is a really clever detail. Um, uh, this is a detail for a suspended wall. It's a, it's a preloaded sprung connection. The idea is this connection is perfectly rigid right up until it hits the, it exceeds the uh, design load in which case the pre-stress is off of that center, center shaft and the springs now carry the load and it becomes soft. So this is a, this is a load fuse. Um, 
And in fact, you see these around. It's the most brilliant thing I've ever seen, but you see them all the time. We have a, a our kids have a, um, a basketball net in the driveway and the hoop is connected with a sprung load fuse like this. So the, so the hoop is stays rigid right up until it has too much load on it and then it's soft and, and it can flop down. Oh, did you? Yeah. Okay, this is the, um, feel free to probably forget everything I've said in this whole lecture, remember this part. Um, you can tell by the crack pattern what caused glass breakage. Um, these images, the one on the left here, if you have four edges supported and you have glass breaks under load, so this would be, would be, you know, wind load on a window or snow load on a skylight or something, you're going to get cracks radiating more or less uniformly um, from the center to the perimeter and then this annular crack pattern as well. If you have two edges supported, again, you're going to have radial cracks going to the supported edges, but you don't have cracks going to the unsupported edges. Uh, breakage due to impact. This is a Hertzian cone. You have probably had a stone chip in your car, and you get something that looks just like this. If you've ever, ever wondered why you can see it, but you can't feel it, it's because it's laminated glass. You get a stone chip on the outside, you get this cone failure, and the outer lamination, the inner lamination isn't, isn't damaged. Um, uh, soft body impact. Again, you look at this radial crack pattern, like this, and an annular crack pattern. Um, hard body impact, typically, it's typified by just the radial crack pattern um, because it's it's just energy it's not force in a way um, site damage um, so this is weld spatter this is the one memorize burn this into your head this is a thermal failure thermal failure is characterized by meandering cracks they will start at the point of high thermal stress and they will meander away from that point. Um, thermal failures can be caused by a number of things. It, it can be caused by a cold bridge. Say you have an aluminum window frame and the glass is accidentally in contact with the window frame. You can get a cold bridge, will we'll precipitate a thermal failure. Um, it'll wander away from, from the edge. It can happen if you have um, if you have a, a glazed wall with an overhang. You're here to tell them about the Working Dog Saloon, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I am. Not so much. Don't tell that story. <laughs> if, you have, if you have a glazed if you have uh, a glazed wall exposed to sunshine with an overhang, so that the, the, the top of the wall is cool because it's under it's shaded where the rest of the wall is very hot or the window is very hot. Um, because of the sun, you get differential stress and you can get a crack. Um, if you have a, a wall, a uh, south facing wall that goes down to the ground and you get snow build up on, on the bottom, again, you can have, have uh, a thermal differential be, between the portion that's shaded and cooled by the snow and the, uh, the portion that is not. Um, or, say, for example, you own a pub and you have south facing windows and you're renovating and you need to block out so people don't see what you're doing and you decide to use black garbage bags in the middle of the winter instead of brown paper um say it, just the hypothetical so, so the inside <laughs> becomes a greenhouse where the temperature is probably 35 degrees yeah. and the outside is minus 25 degrees yeah you end up with yeah break, you break all your windows broke break all your windows yeah. And the reason, the reason it's important you know this is because people are going to say their glass broke and it's structurally flawed. And it's important to know what type of failure it is. If you guys have been in downtown Toronto, I know you have a meeting, uh, you have to fly through the rest of these slides. This is it, I'm stopping. What meeting? Um, it's a harbor front. Um, okay, all right. Are you gonna do them? Uh, do? Well, I, don't, I don't know anything uh, yeah. about this. These are slides that you made. It, like 
ages. These are these are just nice images of press and project pictures. Yeah. And a cool picture of testing test yeah. glass. Okay. I'll wrap it up. Okay. Um, so the reason it's important to know how your glass failed is simply because um, you need to know what it is. So the balconies that all failed in downtown Toronto, I don't know what failure method it was, but there was a panic not knowing if the balconies were strong enough anymore. Uh, and so knowing what, what reason the glass failed is very important. And if you can tell at a glance by looking at the, the break pattern, uh, or the fa failure pattern of glass, it can it can um, kind of bring it back very quickly. I mean, something like that is very high profile, and they have professionals in to review it. Um, but if you have an angry owner who taped up black garbage bags on the inside um, in the winter, you can say, "No, we haven't done something wrong. That's not the way. That's not what you're supposed to do, glass." So it's good to know, you know, if you can tell at a glance, possibly where problems come from. Um, so that wraps up the glass lecture. Um, I am going today make up the uh, finish making up the installations lecture. I have a few slides going on that, but it's mostly they're they're all so different that it's um, it's almost just interesting things to talk about, uh, and I'll try to film that um, today or tomorrow. Okay, guys.